Welcome all. Uh, can I just get a thumbs up that everybody can hear me okay? Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you for, for joining tonight. Uh, we're going to be spending uh, some time together uh, to really break apart um, some tips and tricks for, for advocacy, but also for us to go into a bit of uh, why we as an agency, Catholic Charities, uh, some of you um, may be new to workshops with Catholic Charities. Uh, I, my position um, with our social justice advocacy and engagement team uh, is community education. So I'm the social justice education manager. I work with Lily, who works with our policy team. And Catholic Charities is a, I, I'm fortunate to work at a social service agency that does the charity work, but also does this advocacy work um, for our clients. And so I spend a lot of my time in these spaces, uh, doing workshops, facilitations, trying to get folks to understand some of the issues uh, that are going on in our community. Uh, and, and Lily is really on the ground uh, doing the advocacy work with our, our uh, policy manager. Um, and so I, I'm going to take the first half to kind of frame this evening for us. Um, and uh, we'll start with some in introductions. We have a small, uh, small group tonight, but um, I think that is, uh, uh, that is telling about and is, uh, is common in advocacy spaces and grassroots spaces, our small, mighty uh, teams that care about something. Um, so, uh, so uh, before we get into some introductions, I want to um, begin with uh, a land acknowledgement statement that uh, comes from the Native Governance Center. You know, if we are going to be uh, talking about social justice anytime uh, we're in a space, in a community, talking about issues, talking about uh, social issues, um, it's extraordinarily important for us to get some context of uh, where we're coming from and especially where we uh, are. And I found in doing uh, virtual spaces or throughout the pandemic, it's a really interesting time to think about uh, the land we're on. Oftentimes before the pandemic, we'd come together in a community center or a faith community or one of our sites and we're you know it's positioned on the on the same piece of land to think of where that came from that it is you know it is not ours uh it, it was not ours uh when when it was acquired um and and now we get to think about our each of our individual wherever you are whether it is a, an apartment complex or a home uh, or if you are at work thinking about where in the cities you are do you know the history uh, of that land how it got passed to where it is today um, and the reality is it is a you know an, an oppressive story from the beginning of of uh, land that belonged to our native brothers and sisters so this this acknowledgement from the native governance center not just acknowledges that but also the gift that uh, our our neighbors, our, our American Indian brothers and sisters in the community continue to bring uh, the gifts um, that, that they continue to uh, be a part of um, and being a part of our community. So <clears throat> Minnesota Makoche is the homeland of the Dakota people. The Dakota have lived here for many thousands of years. Anishinaabe people reside here too and reach their current homelands after following the Medja shell to the food that grows on water. Indigenous people from other tribal nations also reside in Minnesota and have made innumerable contributions to our region. So we, we bring that forward uh, as we uh, continue the workshop today as a framing um, that we have a lot of work to do in, uh, in our own social justice spaces uh, around Native American uh, issues, relationships, and we hold that, uh, that history as we move forward. Uh, tonight. So um, moving forward, a, a couple, I just want us to, you know, we're going to have a couple, a couple of times to break out into a group to talk with each other um, and also share, uh, share as a group. And so I just want to bring these guidelines forward that we can all agree on um, that, uh, that we bring to all of our uh, community discussions. One being, we ask that you speak from your own experience. Uh, the my favorite part of my job and the reason why I love the phrase community education is because it really is about the community educating each other, right? Lily and I are here to facilitate a space, but each of you bring your own values and experience from your life, uh, whether you are beginning a, a social justice or advocacy journey or whether you've been doing it for a long time. Um, and so bringing that experience uh, forward is extraordinarily important and is a real gift to each other uh, in this room. But we ask that you 
you know, focus on your own experience and not sharing someone else's. If you're someone who speaks a lot, um, you know, here's a space where uh, you can practice stepping back. And if you're someone who uh, doesn't uh, doesn't find themselves sharing often, it's a challenge to uh, to share some of your experience here and being respectful, challenging ideas, not 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 people. And then when we're sharing stories, whether it's in a one on one or in a small group, uh, my favorite way to think about uh, confidentiality um, is that what is something I heard from a mentor, which is what's said here stays here, what's learned here leaves here. So any specifics that someone shares about an issue or an experience that they've had in a small group, that stays there. But obviously we hope that these learnings uh, moving forward are shared with your communities, uh, be it work, space, neighborhoods, book clubs, faith communities, those kinds of things. So, so with that, um, since we are a, a small enough group, um, we will I'll ask us to go around and I think it will be easiest if uh, if I just call on folks to introduce yourself, um, intro introduce yourself. How do you hear about tonight? What makes you come? Um, and when you think about the word uh, social justice uh, as a phrase uh, or advocacy, what pops into your head? Um, so those are those are the questions for for you to share just as an introduction name community what brought you here and what associations do you make uh, with those uh, with those two phrases or those two words thank you everyone um we you know i in this work uh language is really important and where what we bring to our own definitions of of social justice i think it was uh I, i'm not sure who mentioned that you know, social justice carries uh, some weight with it these days. And, and so uh, how you define it, doing that, if you believe in the work, uh, being able to articulate that to someone who may define it differently, I think is an important start for, for this. When you say advocacy, what do you mean? What comes to mind? Um, and what, what baggage may other people hold with that? What, what assumptions do they make about what that means and, wh and what that entails? Uh, and is that the case for you? And, and I think too often when we uh, get into some of the, the conflict that uh, Tony <laughs> alluded to um, in terms of these conversations and bringing it up or not bringing it up, uh, many times we don't have shared language for what we're talking about, how we're talking about it, uh, and what the implications are of those phrases, words, that that kind of work. Um, so it's, so we're gonna we're gonna define some things uh, throughout the night, and and uh, it's the reality. Our reality is that we are in a political world, right? So uh, we at Catholic Charities uh, are are. It is important for us to make the distinction between being political uh, and being partisan, right? Partisan implies that there is some party affiliation. Uh, political is, is, is merely uh, a word to say that we are in a society in which systems and policies uh, make up how things run, right? Like how uh, cities function and, and where forms come from. We exist in a political space, whether we choose to or not. So saying that you are uh, a political person, uh, while, you, while there may be an assumption that that, is, uh, that means that you are going to protests or whatever that means, it, it, it actually is, is, I think, uh, much, much broader than that, that we are in a political reality. Um, and so uh, some, some, other, <clears throat> some other definitions that we'd like to share from Catholic Charities perspective in terms of how we look at this um, and how we define some of these things, I think it's easier, easiest for me when thinking about some of these different phrases to think about like umbrellas and Venn diagrams. So as a uh, as an organization that is founded in Catholic social teaching, these principles of human dignity, community and the common good, a preferential option for the poor, uh, those are principles that, that our, our agency and our mission are founded upon. And that is why we do social justice. So uh, Adrian, I, I like what you said about um, social justice being the goal, right? So social justice being the pursuit of equal opportunity and access to social and political rights by way of removing systemic barriers and addressing root causes of economic, racial, and social injustices. 
So it's really about getting to the root of problems. Uh, Barb, you mentioned the two feet uh, of loving service. That's an, an image we see a lot in the Catholic social teaching world, which is really this idea that if we are to be serving someone well, on one foot, we should be leaning on charity, which is meeting the immediate need and uh, responding to those emergency needs on one foot. And the other foot that is helping us be serving in a balanced way, that other foot is social justice. And by social justice, we mean not just meeting the immediate need, but asking some of those root cause questions. Why are they there in the first place? If charity is feeding someone a meal, justice is asking, why does the same person continue to come back for food? What is it about our economic system, our housing system that is not allowing someone to be able to afford groceries, right? So that's, that is or, or meals or food in general, right? So those are the two feet uh, that we're talking about. Social justice uh, is, is, is merely addressing the systems and some of the root causes. And then underneath that, you get to specific other types of justices. So when we talk about racial justice, when we talk about housing justice or education justice, this is where uh, we're talking about a specific system. Racial justice is unique in that it is uh, not just in one system, but really threads through all of them. But thinking about it in kind of this tiered way, I think is helpful uh, to understand, you know, what is the overarching value-based mission that makes you do social justice and what is the work that you do from that? So, <clears throat> so uh, Pope Francis um, in, his, in one of his um, documents says that politics, though often denigrated, remains a lofty vocation and one of the highest forms of charity in as much as it seeks the common good. I really uh, enjoy that quote because thinking about politics, advocacy, uh, social justice as a, the, one of the highest forms of charity or, or giving to someone is, is I, I feel like a frame shift for how we think about that work, that, that it, is, it is just as much giving to someone uh, as uh, finding them a bed to sleep in or, or feeding uh, them a healthy meal, right? It's just as much caring for them. Um, and I think that that's the kind of frame shift that we invite uh, everyone here tonight to, to kind of lean into. So uh, you can go through and, and bring up the full circle. So this is a, so this cycle um, is, comes by a lot of names. Um, uh, praxis spiral um, is, uh, or pastoral circle. It's really this idea that, that when, we, when we experience the world, we, if we are being um, contemplative, if we are being reflective about what we experience, um, then we should be able to kind of go through this cycle of experiencing something that's like the what so you have an experience, whether that's volunteering, or whether that's reading the newspaper and learning about something, um, you have an experience. And then the judge and evaluate is the question, so what? Why does that thing matter? Why does that issue that you just came across or that story that you just heard, why does that matter? So what? And then acting is the what now? So what, so what, now what? Um, and, and the way that we're able to move to that, to move through this uh, is by using our own individual values. And so to, in order to move from, uh, from an experience to caring about something, you have to be able to identify uh, the value that, that makes you want to care, right? Um, or else it's just, you know, why, why should that matter? Why should I uh, act in uh, uh, for this issue for this person, right? And so we can we can start with our identities because uh, each of us has a myriad of identities, things that make us us. And if we start there, um, <clears throat> this is an invitation uh, to 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 root ourselves before we even engage in social justice. To root ourselves in the why. Because as we mentioned, social justice is about systems. 
it is the marathon. You know, if charity is the sprint, social justice is the marathon. That sometimes, some days, and Lily can attest to this, having gone through legislative sessions, it feels like a very long marathon. And you're wondering when the finish is going to come because it may not be a one-year thing. You may pass a small policy change that is a small win, but it is part of a much longer journey. And so in order for you not to get burnt out, in order for you not to want to give up, or those moments where you feel tired, it's extraordinarily important for us to be able to root ourselves in that initial question of why did that matter in the first place to me? Why do I care about that? So to be able to say, I am a, a, neighbor, of, in, a neighbor in St. Paul, I am the son of a teacher, and therefore, I have this value that makes me do this. So maybe it's a Catholic and therefore I care for the poor. And because I care for the poor, I want to vote to increase affordable housing, right? That's as an example. Another example, uh, you know, multiple identities can have the same value, right? So whether it be Muslim or atheist, also caring for the poor, also leading to that outcome. But then each value can can lead to multiple actions, organizing to stop predatory lending or supporting raising the minimum wage, right? And so it's this big map of who are you? What are some of those identities that influence and impact the value, your values? And then what is that gonna lead you to care about to take action on? So whether it is your career, uh, you know, lawyer, father, mother, human rights, family prosperity, they all come with, uh, with, uh, with actions that can, uh, that, that, that each value can lead you to care about something. And so an invitation for you tonight, uh, and the first kind of reflective uh, exercise, um, is to think about those identities and those values for yourself. So, so, it does not have to be. So when I say identities, I really mean that in the broadest sense of the word. I mentioned, you know, like <clears throat> if I am the son of a teacher, maybe that's why education justice is so important to me, right? Or if I am a, a, a frequent goer of the boundary waters, maybe that's why environmental justice is, is so important to me, right? And so, and so I invite you tonight, you can go to the next slide, Lily. Um, I invite you to, to take a moment, and we're going to take a few minutes. If you have a writing utensil uh, or, or your computer, or, um, if you have some paper, some place to take notes, I invite you to just scribble down this simple flow chart. In that first column, what are some ways that you define yourself? What are some, when people say, who are you? Or what do you do? Um, what are some of those, those identities uh, of yourself? And then and then in that middle section, what are some values, some, some things that you hold uh, as important? And then that last, that last column, what are some issues that you personally care about? What are some actions you've taken in the past? What are some of those things uh, that are the result uh, of these, these values that you hold? So this is a this is a personal uh, a personal exercise. We're not going to um, ask that you, we're not going to mandate that you share any of what you um, write down, but we're going to take a few minutes um, in in silence and invite you to just jot down some thoughts uh, yourself uh, before we continue. So I invite you to continue to think about that. This is that was not uh, nearly enough time uh, to write down every single one of your identities, values, and things that you've done because of that, right? Um, but but I, the invitation here is to hold this as a tool for when you are trying to find out what to do, right? If you're, if you're like, I want to, uh, I want to donate some of my time um, and, and or resources to an issue, right? And I'm, and I'm trying to figure out uh, what that is. This, is. this is a map that could get you uh, to some of that action, right? And also a tool to come back to when you are in uh, the thick of caring about something, uh, doing some of that uh, action, being in advocacy work, 
uh, to root yourself. Um, it, is a, it is a grounding exercise um, to help us. And, and for me, it is about remembering why I started something in the first place. Um, I have been, uh, I, I didn't kind of introduce myself uh, in full, but I'm not originally from Minnesota. Uh, I'm from outside Chicago. I'm from Aurora, Illinois. Spent some time uh, in most of my uh, adult life in, um, in Omaha, Nebraska. And then I've been with Catholic Charities in Minnesota uh, for six years. But starting uh, in my time in Omaha, I was working um, with an office that did work with uh, with homeless shelters. I lived abroad in, in Ecuador and worked with a, an organization down there that did housing justice work um, and organizing around housing rights. And then now working at Catholic Charities, I've been around uh, homelessness and housing in some capacity uh, now for about 12 years. Um, and there are some times when I, you know, I look back to some of the issues that we've been talking about, you know, we were talking about the same issues uh, back then, and we still are now, and it feels like it's a real uphill climb. Um, and and it's, it's those moments uh, that I can ask myself, like, what is it about myself? What is it about my story? What is it about my values that makes me care about housing, that makes me care about that particular issue, uh, and hope that I can get re-energized to continue, continue working. And the last thing I'll say about that, about kind of the framing of, of grounding yourself uh, to, to, to be doing this sustainably is that uh, my favorite metaphor for justice work uh, when we do it in community with each other, uh, that the image of a choir and, and the uh, invitation that I uh, got from someone when I was in Omaha was to be thinking about this work like a choir and, and how in a choir you are able to take a breath you are able to stop singing because other people are continuing to sing, right? And so paying attention in this work, in this advocacy work to when you need to take a step back, uh, when you need to care for yourself um, and there are going to be people continuing uh, that work for that issue. Um, and then when you're ready to go, that's giving space for someone else to be, you know, taking some time. And so uh, to remember that as well, you're not doing this, this work alone. And so when we think about this, this cycle uh, of, of experiencing something and asking why does it matter and going into action, uh, it's after we, after we ask, so what, um, why does this matter, uh, when we've landed on that reason, then we get into, okay, how do we, how do we act? And that's where method comes in. And that's what Lily's going to uh, be touching on is, okay, so then how do we how do we do this, right? Like what, is, what are some ways in which we can make a change? So um, you can go to the next slide. So, so this is, so this is the, that, that is the question. How do we move from caring about something from our uh, values into action? What, is that, uh, what does that look like? Um, and, and what are some of the uh, levels of impact of those different, uh, of those different actions in the policy and advocacy world. So I'm gonna kick it over to uh, Lily to, to start with some of the, the, the meat of the advocacy work. Thanks, Mike. Um, great first part, awesome. Um, since we are such a small group, I'm not gonna break us into small groups. That would be, it would be too small. Um, so I'm just gonna call on people. Yeah, kind of scary um, <laughs> to, you know, so we have three um, words or phrases, advocacy, public policy, and lobbying. Um, and they all are interconnected. Um, they all are also different from each other, right? Um, so I'm gonna call on someone to maybe just give a, a definition of what you think advocacy um, and public policy is and, and lobbying. And then I'll call on someone else and um, ask, how do you think that they, they interconnect? Um, how do you think that they may differ from each other, right? Based on those definitions that we're going to talk about. Um, Kim, my mom, <laughs> what do you think what, when you think of advocacy or public policy or lobbying? You know, how, what do you think when um, you hear those words? Well, advocacy to me is bringing the community together. Um, 
I was in a business networking group sharing about our nonprofit. And I would say every week, my, my biggest goal is to create advocates from everyone in the room so then they can go out and be able to speak to adoption foster and kinship communities and just make our communities bigger. And public policy would be creating the policies that might help yeah. the communities. Exactly. I just need to do one for all of them. Do you want to do lobbying as well? Um, lobbying, um, just hoping to share enough with the, with the people, the decision makers that we've put in office to um, share what the need is in those communities. Yeah. So they're aware. Yeah, exactly. Um, so advocacy, like, like Kim said, you know, in the nitty gritty is, you know, the public support for um, a recommendation on a particular cause or policy, um, you know, standing up for what you believe in, right? Sharing that your experiences or, or letting people with lived experiences share their experience to advocate on a certain issue um, or piece of legislation. And then the public policy part is, you know, those broad pieces of legislation at different levels of government that are um, making up those things. And then lobbying is something like um, that Catholic Charities does or other partner organizations to get those um, pieces of legislation um, passed, right? That is gonna help our organizations succeed and be successful or get more investments and funding to provide more help for our community members in need, right? Um, and so you can see that they're all, they all interplay together, right? So without advocacy, you can't, um, you can't create successful um, public policy, right? And without lobbying, you also can't create a successful public policy. They all interconnect, but they're all a, a bit different, right? Um, so how does Catholic Charities as a social services provider fit into this? You know, why is advocacy important? Um, where do individuals come into play through advocacy and public policy? Um, why is this important? You know, we, we're a social service provider. You know, we are a 501c3, which is an independent nonprofit. We have to be um, nonpartisan. We can't, you know, support a certain candidate. Um, but this is, you know, somewhat of an advantage because it can help us get in, get nonpartisan legislation passed um, through channels of government needed to improve our programs gain investments and funding for our social um, services work. Um, and then because states and local governments are you know, those critical decision makers um, and major providers and funders for this, um, for health and human services sector, right? Catholic Charities you know, really has to engage in public policy advocacy and lobbying to you know, get that funding to improve our programs, help our partners get funding and, and improve their programs, right? And so through advocacy, we can help achieve meaningful change for our programs. And um, so then the question is, how do you guys, you know, you guys are at this training, how do you guys fit into to this advocacy at Catholic Charities um, as an individual through its, our, all of our achievements, right? Um, advocates, even though you're only an individual person, you do make a difference by being able to use your voice to advocate for change on certain issues or legislation. Um, in a variety of different ways, and I'll get I'll get that to that later. Um, but really, using your voice, your individual voice, does help organizations like Catholic Charities achieve meaningful change for our programs and and funding. Um, and so I'm going to go through a reflection question, or should I hand it off to, or no, sorry. Um, so I'm going to go through a reflection question. So. And I'm going to call in one person um, or two people and take a minute or two to think about something that you have worked to change. So it could be as simple as going to school and, and changing a school policy that you thought was unfair, or you have a big pothole in your neighborhood and you really want to get it fixed, but the city's not getting it fixed. So you have people in your neighborhood sign a petition and bring it to the city, right? Something as simple as that doesn't have to be this big, big, broad thing. Um, that large organizations like Catholic Charities do. So I'm gonna give you guys a minute to think about a time that you may have made some change in your life or for your community. Um, so now I'm gonna go through, you know, how can we as individuals engage in advocacy? And there's, you know, a few different levels um, 
and how we can engage in advocacy, whether with us at Catholic Charities or, or other organizations, right? So um, low level would be signing up for action alerts, sending tweets or letters to your legislators on a specific issue, encouraging them to support or not support that issue, right? Signing a petition that you are passionate or care about on an issue um, and sharing fact sheets, action alerts, or other resources on social media with friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, um, that type of stuff. And the medium level would, would be, you know, writing a letter to an editor, attending a rally, attending an issue-based lobby day, for example. Um, we are involved with Disability Day on the Hill or Homeless Day on the Hill, and those issue-based lobby days, um, you know, convenes groups of ad, or groups of advocates to the Capitol to um, encourage lawmakers to support, a, you know, a whole broad um, list of issues that are, you know, on the agenda, right? And it, it and it brings all these advocates together to, you know, kind of collectively support um, a whole long list and to encourage their lawmakers to also support those issues. And high level um, engaging in advocacy would be, you know, and one might not think that voting in an election is high level, but um, when you have to think about all the steps you have to do in order to, you know, vote in an election, you have to register to vote, whether that's, you know, registering to vote online or sending it in on a, on a paper registration form and mailing that in, um, and then going and actually voting, whether that's printing out your, your ballot and mailing it in or going early and, um, or going on voting day and voting in person, right? Um, so there's a lot of steps. And so I would consider voting in an election very high level because you know, you're using your voice to vote for people that are gonna advocate or support issues um, that you, you really care about, right? So another high level engagement advocacy would be meeting with your legislators to talk about certain issues you want them to support or not support. Um, and then also testifying at a legislative committee to support um, an issue. So um, historically Catholic Charities, um, we've had staff or people with lived experiences come to legislative committees and testify on a certain bill or piece of legislation um, to support have legislators support. And that's a really, really good way um, for organizations like us to, like Barb said, um, put other people in um, other people's shoes, right? But it also is a very high level of engagement. And I'm gonna pass it on um, to Mike. Yeah, so <clears throat> when we think about the low, medium, high, that's not to say that low level, um, you know, advocacy work is not needed. That's just, it, it, those, those categories are about time spent, energy spent, and impact. And so many, many calls add up, right? So a call to a legislator, those add up, but it doesn't take a whole lot of time for one person to do that. Right. Whereas writing a letter to the editor takes more energy, takes more time, and, and that one thing can have a bit more impact. So th it is not to say that, you know, forgetting the low level stuff because it's not important. It's just that it takes a, a, a many of those to add up to be kind of an accumulative impact. And so I, I invite you to think about uh, which of these advocacy actions, you know, in, in all of these levels have you taken? Or if you haven't yet, which do you have the capacity to take on in your life right now, right? Is there one that you're thinking about more than others? Um, it is, we know that, so I am a, I'm a recent father. Uh, I have a one-year-old now. Um, so uh, our first and only, um, and I know that my capacity in life right now, in terms of the uh, extracurricular social justice work that I do looks a lot different than when I was 25, right? And those are stages of, of life um, and stages of even week to week, your capacity and energy looks differently. So I, I think about those, uh, those levels of impact of time uh, and, and, and which right now in this moment for you make sense? Uh, you know, is it, is it, is it following uh, an organization by way of newsletters uh, and action alerts and just, 
you know, just interacting online, occasionally calling legislators. Have you ever been to a day on the hill before? If not, finding which organizations put on those days on the hill, which are usually one or two days uh, in the spring during a legislative session where you can go in person uh, to the Capitol grounds um, and visit with your representatives, right? So, so think about those in terms of what sounds interesting, what do you have, what do you have capacity for? So I invite, are there any, just before we move on, any thoughts as you think about these kind of levels of work and the various pieces to this, anything that is coming up for, for anybody in terms of what, what, is, uh, what is clicking with you, uh, any questions about any of those pieces that we've put out there so far? Okay, so <clears throat> going to, uh, just want to drill in, quickly, specifically on, on the voting piece that was that was mentioned. Lily called that out as maybe feeling like um, it's it's quick and uh, and maybe easy if you're registered and so doesn't really feel on par with like testifying at the Capitol. Um, but it is, I mean, in terms of impact, it's one of the, the most impactful things that you can do, especially if you are taking the time to uh, educate yourself on who is out there, what issues, what platforms. And so uh, here are, uh, you, you can also Google, you know, who, who represents me in Minnesota. Um, but one of the, uh, the first things you can do uh, when talking about this, this, this voting piece and trying to become educated is looking at who is up, you know, who's up for election, making sure that you're registered, getting one friend. We always say like, if you can register yourself and one friend, and if everybody does that, uh, that can that can make a difference. Um, because of re redistricting this uh, this November, everyone is you know up for election, and so uh, it's a big year. And so this is so we are going to you're going to be hearing more from us uh, in the in the next coming months about get out the vote work um, with the community, but also um, in a uh, typically underrepresented community of people who are housing insecure or unsheltered, uh, typically underrepresented at the polls. So that's some of our work as well as trying to get uh, clients, residents, guests um, registered. And so you can scan either of those. Those would bring you to sites that can help you help you with that. Um, and we can also send, send, you know, put these links in the chat as well. Um, So, so a, a quick note going back to, uh, I just want to put a finer point on something that connects to this framing of values and how do you kind of make decisions around issues and voting is an interesting time in which you may care about multiple issues and wouldn't it be ideal if this kind of ballot were what you were filling out like pick the this is this is the 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 uh, candidate who uh, completely aligns with what you believe in, right? And then there's like another one that's like not so much, and then there's like a definitely not. Like if that was if that was the way, that would be very uh, simple, um, and we would feel like okay, I am fully engaging uh, in all of my values and the issues that I care about. Um, and 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 the reason I say this is because for for many individuals because that is not the case, because they cannot find one person that fully encapsulates kind of all of the values and issues um, that, uh, that they care about, then they're not going to vote, right? Like they would rather abstain than um, kind of uh, vote for someone who disagrees on, you know, a, a, a couple of issues. And so it is a real discernment. It is a time for discernment for you to think about not just who, um, who you would like to see in, in a seat, but who, based on their voting history, based on how they talk about things, how they talk about communities most affected, Barb, to your point about not having it be top down, listening to the language of, of, of candidates around how they're talking about communities. You can, you can really learn a lot from that, from that type of language, right? And, and so, it's not just about who you want to see in the seat, but also who might be most likely to listen to you when you do come to 
advocate for the issue that they don't agree with you on, right? So it's it's also about thinking about who's who's maybe most likely to to work with you uh, in this advocacy work. And so some some tips for you know this this coming fall this this early winter when we're in this season um, is to remember that not all sources are equal. So there are many many resources out there uh, where you will read about someone or an issue, and it's important to maybe find find another right another and see and to compare and contrast some of these sources to look at when someone is maybe talking in black and white right uh advocacy social justice there are a lot of gray areas systems are complex and so if you see language that really is this kind of binary uh for me that's a red flag that something is missing right um and and listening for what is not there again to barb's point uh, one thing that might not be there is the actual voice of the people most affected by an issue. Where does that, where, where do you see that in articles and in interviews? Uh, when, you know, how are they talking about the communities most affected? Um, and, <clears throat> and then I mentioned you can look up their voting history. That can be really helpful as you try to educate yourself uh, on, on where you most align um, in terms of, of voting at the polls. And so this is a, uh, you know, you can use your smartphone camera to pull up uh, the uh, voting history website. Um, we can also uh, send that as a follow-up. We'll make sure all the links in this PowerPoint are included in the, in the follow-up email. So, so just a, that, so what wanted to, to put that finer point because it is coming up. It is a very uh, important uh, uh, season. And so Lily can, uh, walk through this this timeline here and then uh, take us forward. Yeah, so like Mike said, elections and voting really does um, connect with advocacy. And I think it is one of the best ways that you can advocate um, individually is by voting for people that you think will advocate for the issues you care about most, right? Um, so just wanted to give you guys some, you know, Election dates are always changing, so I wanted to share with you guys the 2022 election timeline. Um, Hennepin County made this really awesome graphic with the timeline. So the primaries are coming up on, uh, on August 9th, um, and then September 23rd is when absentee voting starts for the general election. And then the general election this year is on Tuesday, November 8th. Yeah. And big year, like Mike said, um, we had redistricting this year. So um, a lot of um, districts have changed. There's been new districts. So there's everyone is, is, has, um, is up for election. Um, so I wanted to give you guys kind of a fuller picture of what can be achieved through advocacy, because you know I think when you're writing an email here or there or tweeting your legislator here and there, or calling them here and there, you know, you might not see the end result of, of your actions and advocacy and using your voice to advocate for a certain issue to your lawmakers. Um, and you might not see you know, that end result, right? Um, and so because of um, your guys' individual advocacy um, with organizations like Catholic Charities, we have been able to, in the past couple of years, pass really, really important pieces of legislation that helped support not only us, but our partners in the, in the housing and homelessness arena. Um, so like last year, we reinstated um, child care waiver reimbursements. Um, we have a Catholic Charities has a child development center in Northside. Um, and during COVID, there was a, a rate waiver reimbursement um, that was saving us you know, a lot of money because kids were out um, with COVID, whether they had COVID or quarantining, any of that. Um, and so now we passed in 2022 that same waiver reimbursement. Um, so our child um, development center wasn't losing thousands of dollars from absent children as a result of COVID. Um, and it's, you know, really uh, to make sure that child care centers like the one that Catholic Charities has is able to remain open. Um, in 2021, um, Catholic Charities helped um, strengthen housing support um, for residents and landlords in two ways. So we, they increased the monthly base rate funding, and then they also waived absence requirements for individuals seeking health care treatment. Um, in 2021, 
um, emergency aid for immediate COVID-19 pandemic response needs. Um, the outcome of that was the through the Federal American uh, Rescue Plan or ARP Act early in 2021 that brought over 2.5 billion um, in aid to Minnesota. And there's specific grants and programs that were able to get some of this money, um, including some of our emergency shelters. Um, it also provided funding for renters assistance and childcare assistance. Um, and then we also received 26.5 million one-time funding for emergency services programs. So like Catholic Charities benefited from that um, through getting funding um, through this for our emergency service program. Um, other things that are not on here, um, we you know, help support legislation that got passed that allowed homeless youth to obtain birth certificates easier um, and then increasing investments in shelter length mental health grants that was in this past legislative session. So all of these things, you know, somewhat complicated, are were able to be passed by, you know, a mixture of, of lobbying efforts on our end with, in, with our partners and individuals like you who are showing up for, for this training, who are the ones sending those action alerts, you know, your email tweeting or calling your legislators, right? And all of those things build up into success through passing legislation. And so we're still advocating for a lot of things. You know, this past session, um, not a lot got passed. Um, you know, organizations like Catholic Charities that are working in the housing and homelessness um, arena are still really looking for increased and in ongoing investments for the emergency services programs, um, the Homeless Youth Act, housing infrastructure bonds. So if you're not familiar with housing infrastructure bonds, you know, um, it's investments that are given to organizations like us to be able to. Um, reuse uh, existing buildings, right? And so our, Elliot, our new Elliott Park building, which um, includes um, permanent supportive housing program, um, as well as admin offices, we were able to use an HIB um, to revamp that building and, and use it for what we're using it for now. Um, we're still um, advocating for housing support program reform. Um, so right now there are people in the housing support program that are paying, you know, more than 90% of their income ought to be in this program, right? And so one of the things we want to do is really cap that at 30%. So they're not left with $111 to spend for the rest of the month. You know, we really want to make sure that we're being able to build up people's financial capacity um, so that if they do choose, they are they have the ability, financial ability to, you know, exit out of the program um, and move on to more stable housing, right? Um, we're still, you know, fighting for eviction reform and discriminatory practices in housing and criminal justice reform, um, because, you know, when we talk, and Barb, this goes to your point, um, one of the things that my, that I do and, and my boss Lorna does is um, we sit down with staff and or clients or, or partners, people with lived experiences, um, to figure out, you know, what in our programs are not working, right? What are, what are the barriers for folks um, that are experiencing homelessness, what are their barriers to, to getting stable housing, um, to obtaining a job? Um, and two of the biggest things are having a, a criminal or eviction record, right? And so those are some huge, huge things that we've had conversations with um, staff and clients and residents or people with lived experiences, that those are the biggest, biggest barriers um, in order to obtain housing or um, to get a job. So we're still advocating for a lot of things in, in um, this next 2023 session. And I just want to thank you guys for, for joining this training because you really do make a difference in Catholic Charities and our partners' um, legislative like agenda. So, and I'm going to, I encourage you guys, if you are not signed up for our action alerts, um, to stay informed, use this QR code to sign up. Um, we don't, email you guys that often, you know, I'll send um, important voting dates, um, but as well during the legislative session, this is a, a way for you guys to um, stay informed on what we're doing for our, um, our legislative agenda and also to advocate on issues um, that are important to us at Catholic Charities, but probably also important to you guys as well. So I'm just gonna leave this up here for a second and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it off to Mike. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, so I, as, as we wrap up, I'd like to invite you to think about um, 
what Lily shared around uh, methods, what are the various, you know, actionable items, thinking about your own framing of uh, and grounding for what issues you care about, and why you care about them. Um, and, and curious, what is something as we approach a, uh, a voting season, uh, as we re approach another legislative season in the late winter, um, early 2023, uh, what is something that you hope to do, even if it is not, you know, it is as, as small or as large as you want, but as you're thinking right now of action, um, what is something you hope you hope to uh, accomplish, do, learn more about? What is something that you can take uh, take forward and, and commit to? And also, what questions do you still have? What more, what more information do you need? Uh, what is still kind of unknown? So I, I pose that question to, to the group. Feel free to, to unmute. I'd love to hear from a few folks. But what is something, uh, as you think about advocacy in action, uh, maybe one thing that you're kind of hoping to in the coming seasons uh, to get engaged with to try? One more, um, uh, you know, when, when, when talking about uh, the hope or the, the desire to do something like calling legislators or go to the, go to, you know, um, Capitol Hill and, and do something there, I think it's important to remember uh, that, um, or I can share my own experience that early on, I thought that I needed to, and this is just kind of how I am, I think as well, that if I were to do that, I need to know all of the details. I need to know if they were to ask me a question back, I would need to know the answer. And when I held that as my threshold for knowledge or education, then I was just never doing it because I was afraid that I was not knowledgeable enough about the bill numbers, about the policies, about the systems, right? But they have plenty, and by they, I mean representative senators, have plenty of people showing up at the, in their doorways who simply just care about the people who are affected by the issue. They don't know anything about the system or even what to do about it necessarily, but they just know that something needs to be done. We have a lack of affordable housing and we think that should be a priority. I don't know where or how or in or what funds need to happen to make that happen. I'm just going to voice that I think it's important. And that that is okay. That is okay. That is that is actually a, a great place to start. And so uh, if you can remember that it's that most of the people who are doing this work are not are not experts, are not experts in in any of the issues. Um, and that professional lobbyists are, and that's their job. And uh, and you just have to just have to show up and care. Um, and so we, as we end, you know, we invite you to that work. And, and the, the easiest, lowest hanging fruit is to sign up to be an advocate. Um, you can, all we need is your name and email. Your address is optional. And I will just say that the only reason we ask for your address is so that if there is a particular district that we're targeting, that we can better target uh, by way of location, right? So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't opt you into snail mail. You won't start getting junk mail uh, by giving your address. That's really the only reason. So you can do that on our website. Uh, the link is in the chat. That's, that is the best way to stay connected with us as we move forward into voting season, uh, as well as this next legislative season. And then because we are a large social service agency, uh, we have plenty of volunteer opportunities. Our team, our, our friends uh, on our volunteer team, Mary and her team make it so easy for groups, individuals, families to volunteer at our many different sites. And Barb, you were asking about, you know, moving from uh, this kind of top down way of doing something to, you know, on the ground with with people, how do we make that more, uh, more of a reality. And I think volunteering is an incredible way to do that, uh, to be able to see a program to see clients, I think that is, uh, that is another way to continue to ground yourself in this work, and to share stories 
with with people who are friends, family, coworkers, to, to have those experiences and then to share. <clears throat> I recognize that some volunteer experiences do not put you in positions to hear the life story of someone in front of you. You know, I think sometimes uh, volunteers may come in with that expectation that people are going to uh, kind of open up their hearts and share their stories and talk about the barriers and and you get that kind of that kind of information when sometimes it's just a simple a very short hello and you're, you're maybe serving a meal or preparing a meal, and that is where I would invite. Um, in addition to joining our work here, I would invite you. Uh, as we talk about educating ourselves, we can do that with stories, with people uh, who are being impacted by issues, who have already chosen to share their story by way of books, of, uh, of newspaper articles, I mean, narratives uh, that we can find in novels uh, or, 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 or books or short stories or in the news our spaces to be inspired as well. Uh, we may not be in a space where we are interacting one-on-one -on -one in an intimate way with someone who is sharing their story. And so I would invite you to think about education as in, in, uh, in more than just being educated on the issue, but also uh, hearing stories, reading stories, um, and sharing those. The advocacy part comes from taking that story and then sharing it with someone. It may be that's a representative or senator, maybe that's your friends or family. So, you know, I, the, uh, a book like Evicted that uses their, that, that the author spoke and built relationships with many people in Wisconsin uh, who had stories of eviction and housing insecurity. That's a great example of, of hearing those narratives uh, without necessarily talking to someone one-on-one. -on -one. So there are very various ways to be doing this. And then lastly, if, you, if your group, if, you, if your uh, community, whether that be a neighborhood group, a book club, uh, your church, your faith community, your work could benefit from these kinds of workshops around housing justice, racial justice, advocacy, Catholic social teaching, that's what that's what we do. That's what our team does. Um, and we'd be happy uh, to talk with you more. Uh, that's You can contact me for any uh, uh, invitations or potential facilitations. Barb, I think we've connected on the, we, we have a homelessness simulation that we've done in the community around youth homelessness, as well as family homelessness. Um, and so we invite you to reach out if you think that your community could benefit from, from any of this. Well, Lily and I, uh, you have our emails. We'll make sure you get you get all of the links uh, and our contact information and a follow up. And we're really grateful that you took the time. You could have been doing anything else uh, tonight, so we're really grateful that you're here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Have a good, have night. A good night. Thank you.